aqueles que estão presencialmente aqui hoje. Good morning, everyone. We would like to uh, greet everybody that is here. It's a high prestige for us. I would like to thank everyone who is here in person and also through our channel on YouTube and through Zoom. Today, we have an event that we're going to close the cycle and in a way start another. We're going to talk about the structure and leadership in the public sector. We would like to thank everybody who accepted this, uh, this event. Talk about leadership. I am a business administrator and it is a theme that is very relevant and always impacts us. It is very important to talk about leadership. A lot of people talk about leadership. And recently, we have discussed this in the public sector. We have a lot of reference documents that bring some prescriptions for us and about the existence of leadership and sustainability in leadership. And Recording everything in progress. works to improve the public sector. Today, we have a great chronogram. I would like to thank on behalf of ENAP, we would like to thank Apocalyptico for the dialogues that we have had recently. And we thank you for your partnership. So today, we're going to launch at the end of the event a strategy to develop leadership that reflects the activity that was made by Rodrigo's team in the last uh, few years. We had a series of programs that have worked with leadership. We have the program Leadership Now. We have a program about the trends in leadership. We've had a robust work to talk about competences in leadership. They were be developed uh, throughout programs that were developed here at ANAPI. And we have to take a look at the sustainability of this, these programs. Everything that we do today is to close the cycle and to understand and present a formal document that will be made available about what was made about proposals so we can continue this, uh, ac these activities because we have to think about public administration and leadership. So for any model that we have, for anything that we do to understand the public sector, we have to understand people. So we cannot develop this without leadership, and we have to continue these processes in a sustainable and inclusive way. Today, talking about includes talking about including and including inclusiveness in leadership. Uh, leadership has to be uh, has to reflect the reality. So we had this concern here in Anapi since I got here. We are concerned about developing leadership that is not apart from the teams, apart from society. So we have programs that reflect and also work with the idea that people are only going to be able to lead when, when they have a deep understanding and they have a diversification in their teams. So I would like to congratulate Rodrigo and the team because I think that inserting this equity, this diversity in the leadership in the public sector, this was a huge advancement. And we cannot speak about leadership without contemplating this for the future. So we'd like to thank Rodrigo congratulate the event, congratulate ENAPI, and we're going to have a schedule with some moments today. I'm going to give the word in a while to Mrs. Hamilton, and we're going to have a storytelling with Nadja, Met Nadja and Baum from Canada. We're also going to represent, be a, have a representative of from Foundation João Pinheiro. And Rodrigo Torres is going to share what has been made uh, for here at ENAP. 
and we're going to talk about the leadership that is being doing here. So we saw in the, in the past that we had to understand the profile and the needs of high executives in Brazil and how can we amplify the diversification in leadership. So I'm going to give the word now to Mrs. Hamilton to continue our schedule and I would like to wish you good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to just try sharing my screen uh, before I start speaking. Uh, just give me a second. Can someone give me a thumbs up to say that if you are seeing the screen? Brilliant. I can see many thumbs ups on the screen. Um, thank you so much. Um, we are so thrilled to partner with Inapi um, for this exciting event. And a big thank you to Rodrigo, Mariana, Joao. It's been such a pleasure to work with all of you uh, over the past years. Um, we believe that there's never been a more compelling case for investing in public leadership, especially when the human race is grappling with the deep challenges of climate change, economic crisis, job security, inequity, and such. All of these becoming increasingly complex with each passing year. We believe that strong public leadership is the key to preparing for the future. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'd love to share with you what we are seeing through our work as emerging themes, skills, and paradigms for leadership around the world. One of the key themes, and I'm, I'm guessing this is not a surprise to you, that is taking center stage for many governments is digital transformation. A recent civil service digital skills report in the UK shared that over 75% of civil servants would like to receive more digital skills training. And in response to this, the government has already made plans to upskill at least 90% of the senior civil service on digital and data essentials. This is really heartening to see as one of the biggest challenges in driving transformation as shared by our community of public servants is changing the culture and getting the buy-in of their senior leadership. And we're seeing similar trends in other places such as India, UAE, where data and digital skills are being tied closer to required competencies, performances, and development frameworks. In a recent survey that we did, we found that 80% of public servants, while motivated to act, don't have the tools or the training to make a difference to climate change. This is further exasperated by the fact that as recession looms, most government teams need to deliver climate results with limited resources. On the positive side though, we are finding that the urgency to mainstream climate policies across government is now being recognized, finally. While there are many skills critical for a 21st century public servant, I will speak to two that perhaps need the biggest mind shift. The first one being putting citizen engagement at the heart of civil service reform. The primary need and benefit of doing so is the urgent need to rebuild trust in government institutions. We've seen the example of Taiwan, where a combination of digital reforms with civic engagement delivered an impressive COVID response. We're also seeing a number of countries using public engagement as a tool to hear the voices and achieve equitable outcomes for those who have historically been left out or left behind. This is perhaps the most significant skill for this decade, resilience building. It has an external and an internal aspect to it. Externally, the pandemic and everything that followed has changed the playing field for the civil service. As you know, citizens expect you to not only have the foresight of risks, but also expect you to be able to rapidly shift and adapt to any crisis. Internally, the pandemic placed unprecedented demands on public servants. We have heard countless stories of public servants continuing to serve from a place of duty, but reporting a burnout, feelings of helplessness. As a result, personal resilience has now become a must have. 
While there are training models and leadership models that address resilience building both within and through the work of civil service, there are a lot more conversations to be had on how to achieve this in a meaningful way. I'm now going to talk about a few trends that we've seen underpinning the paradigm shift in leadership models, leadership models in civil service. The first one being many senior civil servants training is now being mandated to focus on national priorities and solutions. Now, while the training itself is not new, the integration of that with competencies, performance, and professional development is definitely new. The second trend is the strategic focus on next-gen leadership. Given the challenges ahead, the success of public servants relies on attracting and building a pipeline of high caliber talent. The younger generation is known to prefer working for organizations that have a positive impact. Now, this should ideally work in the public sector's favor in the battle for talent, but many public bodies are yet to make the most of this advantage. We are seeing development of induction programs, apprenticeships, orientations, increased training opportunities, and the like to address this. For long, leadership training and opportunities, often due to the in-person nature and the costs of involved, have been restricted to the top levels of civil service. And recently, we are now witnessing many schools and training institutions for public servants taking a systems-wide approach to training and expanding their remit to all levels of civil service. Governments are now also open to partnering with agile organizations, especially small and medium enterprises alongside big consulting firms to equip leaders. At Apolitical, over the past few years, we work with several of our government partners globally, including Inapi, to transform their teams with the ideas, the knowledge, the skills, and the community they need. Lastly, and this is perhaps something that we are really excited about, the most positive trend is that public bodies globally are acknowledging that there has to be a fundamental paradigm shift towards leadership in order to solve the problems of today and tomorrow. I wanna end this talk by thanking all of you in the room on YouTube and virtually, the real change agents within government for your leadership and the work that you do. And thank you in RP team again for hosting this important conversation. I'd love to answer and take any questions when we come to the Q&A session. Thank you. Nadia, over to you. Thank you very much. Am I audible enough? Yes. All right, all right. Um, well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever everyone is. Um, my name is Nadia. I am from Kenya, former deputy minister. Um, so I want to narrate a story about relatability when it comes to public leadership, uh, vulnerability, digital adaptation, transparency, and emotional intelligence. We're in a world where we want to see our public leaders and be able to relate with them. Gone are the days where we look at leaders who are in public as demigods, people who know it all, people who have no emotions, people who don't really want help and people who are not ready to listen and be part of the change. And there's one really successful thing that happened to me while I was in public leadership. And that was, I gained the trust of so many young people in my own country, but across the continent itself. Which got me thinking that the one thing that we really need to amplify among each other is relatability. Now, what does relatability mean when it comes to public leadership or global trends in leadership? It really means you being a public leader, seeing yourself through the eyes of those that you lead, seeing yourself as a person who not only dictates, 
but also comes up with solutions that are sustainable, solutions that are relatable, and solutions that are able to be adapted into the digital space. Number two, I realized that a lot of times in public leadership, leaders were not allowed to be vulnerable. Emotional intelligence wasn't one of the basic things that public leaders have. But as global trends go by, it is so important for us to invest in our emotional intelligence because as leaders, you can really be challenged from time to time. Gone are the days where we look at the people we lead and we throw our frustrations to them. But it's time for us to really internalize those frustrations and create a path that is very enabling, a path that is very trusting, and a path that is very building. When I talk about transparency, I do mean being really transparent to the people you lead. However, in public leadership, we really have to build boundaries. Boundaries from a leader's perspective to the people they lead and boundaries from the people they lead to the leader's perspective. These boundaries help us to navigate the different programs, the different policies, the different agendas that are in public leadership. And I realized that a lot of times, a lot of leaders don't have boundaries and they usually take up so much and they usually want to solve everything at a go. And that is where we have a problem because what happens is there's a buildup of frustration. What happens is there's a lot of intertwining when it comes to what are the agendas we need to look at and what are the agendas that we need to leave behind. Now, when it comes to digital adaptation, Throughout my almost three years as a public leader, I realized that when I took up social media, when I took up, up tra traditional media, and when I took about, up my own voice into these spaces, it created a sense of trust between myself and the young people that I was leading. Digital transformation opened up a wide range of opportunities for young people to understand that they too can be part and parcel of a space of a place where they can actually build and conjoin with their own leaders and create a sustainable platform. Digital transformation also breaks down that void that is between public leaders and the people they lead. The void that is there is one that has been there for the longest time. But because of the different global trends that we are able to adapt from wherever we are, take an example, I'm in Kenya and I'm speaking on this platform, it has really unlocked a gateway for people to get more insights, more information, for people to be more confident, and for people to really reach out to those that they believe can change their space or the spaces of others. So basically global or public leadership really, really has to transform because we are in a time where people are now tired of listening to what they're being told and they want to see their leaders and feel that they are part and parcel of the agenda that they're bringing on. Time has gone by and it's no longer about how can I reach you, but it's about when I walk into your space or when I reach you online, how are you going to benefit me? And how are you going to build me from one space to another? Public leadership, not only nationally, continentally, but globally has now transformed to become the tool for economic development and digital transformation. It's become a space where we now discuss it's become a space when we now not only look at budgets, but we also look at the well-being of one another. We also look at how are we protecting and saving our environment. We also look at how are we advancing and how are we making each other relatable in order to build sustainable, positive, and growing spaces and growing communities and growing countries that will be able to support each other's agenda. And so for me, when I talk about public leadership, when I talk about success, and when I talk about relatability, I'm looking at the growing trends that we have and how can we use those and build them to benefit us. And when I talk about us, I mean the global space because public leadership is a glo global space. 
How are you using what you have, the ideas you have, the challenges you got, and building them in a very conducive, in a very sustainable, in a very positive manner, in order to break away from the demigods that we see in leaders, in order to break away from the barriers that are there in leaders, and in order for us to make our leaders also understand that leadership and public leadership is conjoining together our ideas, building together on our digital spaces, and really creating a global space that has no borders, that has no challenges, and that is all about transformation, all about growth, and all about empowerment. So that is what I have to say. Thank you very much. Nadia, I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Joao from an app in Brazil. Uh, thanks a lot yes. for your presentation. You are so quick here, over here, that you didn't present yourself for the audience. And, and that's, that's for us, it's a privilege having you here with us, uh, especially uh, for those who haven't met Nadia yet, but she she's a reference on dealing with public leadership and uh, um, understanding the power of uh, girls and women and the process of the inclusive leadership. So thanks a lot for the work you're doing. When a political uh, mentioned about your name, you're over here at an app, you're the first, all, everyone in the team, was, she's the name that we want to have here presenting uh, uh, for all of us. And thanks a lot for um for uh, dealing with uh, this this idea of public leadership, digital digital transformation, and the perspective of women and and girls and the power, I believe that we need as public leaders to invest more on um, understanding what the young are doing for the change for changing the world. I still think that we have uh, some. A bias on 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 the level of understanding that sometimes we in the public, uh, in the government, we normally we don't invest a lot and explore more the young uh, leaders that are doing so many things around the world, and especially on the communication, social media, they are much better than <laughs> than ours, and we need to understand their their protagonism on the process. So Nadia, once again, I just want to present you for all the participants over here and and just give your bio because yes, that's important. And then you're gonna do the same with the next speaker. So just give him a moment. Gente, então a Nadia Ahmed, ela é de Quênia. Ela é funcionária. Nadia is from Kenya. She's a she works for the government. She's a vice minister for the technology ministry and on topics for the youth. She's a professional working with the public relationship, specialist in communication and politics. She's a diplomat in, uh, in the cultural area. She has a wide experience in communication, uh, campaign management, and in defense of girls and women. And she's very experienced in capacitation leadership programs. Nadia. Thanks, a political, for uh, indicating uh, Nadia's name for us. And now I hand over to uh, Neil Bauer from Canada. Uh, Neil Bauer, uh, thanks a lot for coming. I'm going to present you in Portuguese as well for all the participants over here. Uh, Neil Bauer is a professor visitante de, uh, de prática na Max... is a visitor professor in Max Bell School of Fox Valley. He's a vice president of the Division of uh, Innovation in the uh, Public Service of Canada. He's also the vice minister at in the uh, National Council of Treasury in the National Center of Analysis of the Foundation and Re Human Resources and Human Development in the Business Development too. He's uh, graduated by uh, Net University and St. Thomas University, and he supported the communities and the data for the Can Canadian government in an advanced program of the analysis for the human resources program. Yours. Thank you very much, and thank you to ANAP and Apolitical for the opportunity to present to you all. Um, it's great to have a chance to talk with public sector leaders. I personally believe that uh, leadership matters and government really matters, and it is a good time to be a public servant, and it is a good time to be a public servant leader. 
And um, let's see if you agree. <laughs> Uh, the first golden rule is that um, leadership is a ground game. So only the leader can assess what the context is and the type of leadership required. So this is going to differ from business unit to business unit, from department to department, and from government to government. So for sure, the first rule of leadership is that to be a professional leader, you should be choosing the style and the approaches that suit the context the culture, the business processes, and the challenges that you face. So, of course, every story is different, but let, but let me tell you a little bit uh, of my story. So, first of all, I think when we think about public sector leaders, there is often a tension between vanguards and guardians. So, what do I mean by that? Um, vanguards are people that are out there trying to leverage new developments, new technologies to create new public sector value for citizens. Guardians are people whose role it is, is to protect the wisdom of the status quo, to make sure that the system continues uh, as it is and that institutions are strong. So typically in the public sector, guardians are the kinds of leaders we foster and reward and promote. So usually you become a senior public servant by being safe hands, by being able to protect prerogatives, to protect the law, regulations, policies, uh, and institutions. In fact, when public service leaders sometimes go to the private sector, the private sector says they like public service leaders because they know how to keep us out of trouble. And they know how to be good stewards of people and resources and also communications. And so for many years in Canada, at least, the guardians were the senior leaders uh, and that has continued for some time but of course times are changing and so the environment is changing radically we see changes in uh, technology with uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence real-time communications social media the changing nature of work distributed authorities um, social unrest and economic vulnerabilities uh, uh, demographics uh, and uh, many other social trends, you know, that are happening in our society. And so the American military calls this a VUCA environment, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, V-U-C-A. So that's, that would seem to suggest, though, that, that, the, that the vanguards need to step up. And as public service leaders, we need to start rewarding the vanguards and promoting the vanguards and having more vanguards in the public service. So this balance between guardians and vanguards is shifting. That's a tall order because public servants are not trained to be vanguards. Uh, we're, you know, a startup or an entrepreneur is trained to be a vanguard, but, but, but we aren't. Uh, and so that is a big shift and it requires us to, to really rethink our role as, as leaders. For some people, this is a reason to despair. They look at all the changes and they get very depressed and demotivated. But in fact, the VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous, is when vanguards are at their best. By the way, it's also when guardians are at their best and um, uh, guardians, you know, it's guardianship is not a bad thing. In fact, we're all part guardian. Uh, and uh, but when things get uncertain, the guardians really step up and resist change. That's not a bug. That's a feature of the environment. Uh, but the vanguards also step up because we need to start experimenting with new technology and new approaches and new management techniques. So um, in this environment, uh, we really do need innovation. The problem is innovation is a trap because if all you want to do is innovate, this will turn a lot of people off. You should not speak, in my view, of innovation in and of itself. That will lead to pilot projects and demonstrations, but it will stop there. I would encourage you to instead speak about excellence. And if you talk about excellence in your service, in your program, in your, uh, in your institution, you will necessarily find in the current environment that you will need to experiment and innovate. So in other words, innovation and experimentation is a pathway to excellence. But as leaders, I encourage you to talk about excellence 
first and foremost, because that will attract all uh, of your stakeholders and all of your um, and all of your guardians as well as your vanguards. Um, in the current environment, though, you're not going to achieve excellence, and you're not going to innovate by talking to the usual suspects. We really need as public service leaders to have unconventional conversations and to reach out to different corners of society, of course, representing the societies that we uh, that we serve uh, and also reaching out to the the unconventional um, folks to try to figure out what uh, where some solutions might lie. The fact that the, the, the environment is so dynamic and unpredictable means that the solutions are probably not, not going to come from the, the usual suspects. So in other words, we should be networking and learning as part of our leadership uh, practice. And in fact, I would say we should be learning by doing. I really believe that every public service leader should have their eye on artificial intelligence. All of us should have our eye on a project of artificial intelligence, and it should relate to our business. The same thing with advanced data analytics, the same thing with uh, design thinking, the same thing with um, other digital approaches and, and technologies that we should be using. So let me also say that um, in this environment, one of the, the fundamental changes for public service leaders is the emergence of data as a third essential resource. We're used to talking about our human resources, how many people we manage, or our financial resources, how much money we manage. We're not accustomed to thinking about what data we produce and use and the explosion of data and the use of administrative data and words as data is a revolution for the public service. And typically the public service lags the private sector, but uh, citizens will have greater expectations that we will be generating and using data and using that for public good uh, as well as other technologies. Uh, finally, I just I just want to say a, a few things about about digital and about COVID. Um, on digital, I I heard the term used. I actually don't like the term digital because it sounds like it's just about technology. It sounds like you need a degree in computer science to do something digital. I prefer the term modern because I think that citizens expect that governments will use uh, mobile technology, smartphones, and the internet to its full potential to deliver value for citizens. Citizens are, expect that we're going to be able to deliver services on digital platforms securely 24 seven with, uh, with um, ease and simplicity and, and beautiful design. Uh, they're going to expect Amazon type services from government in all business lines. And this is not just a matter for service and program managers. The public policy instrument of choice of citizens will be digital platforms. So all public service leaders, whether they consider themselves policy, programs, or service, need to be preoccupied with digital platforms as a policy instrument and as a service and management instrument. So if we think about uh, a digital platform really as a modern platform and the platform of choice for citizens, that really requires us to work together with our technologists, with our strategic program managers and our policy advisors together to help, uh, to help move us forward. And certainly in Canada, we have a long way to go. We are behind where citizens expect us to be. We are behind other governments and we are behind the private sector in this. And so there's a matter of urgency for that. You probably have articulated uh, digital standards or digital principles. Um, I'm happy to share those from uh, Canada, but these are really meant to be guideposts for leaders to help them operate in the uh, in the environment. And then finally, a word on COVID. Um, obviously, the pandemic has meant um, dramatic changes for all of us, not just changes in how we behave, but also changes in society. It has exposed uh, cleavages um, uh, in, in society. It has affected the economy. Uh, it has been very pervasive around the globe. I just want to tell you that I, I really think in terms of public sector leadership, there are kind of five superpowers that I've seen through COVID. And the first superpower for a public service leader is focus, the ability to focus on the business that needs to get done. And even though they're separated by uh, technology and, and everything else, the ability to really narrow down on the core role uh, of a unit and to drive that forward as a manager is one superpower. A second superpower is technophilia, the love of technology. So the ability to embrace technology and not treat it as a 
uh, as a, um, you know, something to be avoided or, or feared or, or anything else, but to embrace it. And that's, that's a second superpower. A third superpower is resilience. The ability of our leaders to be resilient uh, in their families, in their communities, in their in, the, in themselves, uh, and that has been um, uh, an essential ingredient during COVID. The fourth superpower I would say is empathy. And if there's one thing we've learned from the social dynamics around uh, COVID, uh, the, the the disruption to people's lives, the public service leader that is empathetic and able to uh, go beyond the technology and really reach out to their colleagues and, and employees is, is really a superpower. And then the fifth superpower would be collaboration. So even though we have technology uh, between us, the ability to reach out to colleagues and, 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 and sustain collaboration uh, through this times has really been great. So, so I hope the picture that I've painted you for the public service leader is one that is very dynamic. And in particular, we must all continue to be good guardians. But in fact, we need to learn and act in ways that help us to be better vanguards to um, anticipate and to um, uh, be uh, create value uh, in these volatile and uncertain and chaotic times. And there's no time more volatile, uncertain and chaotic than COVID. So we should learn lessons as public service leaders uh, in our leadership practices uh, and move them forward. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I look forward to your questions uh, in the Q&A period. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, Neil. Uh, here's Rodrigo Torres, the Director of Executive Education here in NAP. Uh, we appreciate a lot. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, deep and important reflections with us. Um, I love the idea of uh, changing the use of expression uh, digital government for modern government. I think that's uh, pretty important for some of our reflections nowadays. Um, now I will uh, keep the, the agenda here. Nós uh, vamos ter agora a próxima etapa do nosso, do nosso We're evento. going to have the next phase of our event. Our colleagues that were here in this first phase, they will continue with us. We're going to have a moment for questions and answers. And now we're going to have a conversation table, conversation round. For an app, we wanted to make some um, reflections about the national and international level. So the idea was to bring good practices, reflections of uh, international partners. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Pooja, Nadia, and you for bringing some of your good practices. They have fulfilling this important role together with ANAPI to reflect uh, about ANAPI in the international environment. To be inserted in this, uh, it's very important. So thank you very much, Pooja, for all your, uh, your collaboration. It, and also, we wanted to have experiences from the state and the third sector that have fulfilled an important role here in Brazil. So I would like to thank here to our table, Monica Bernardi. She is the vice president of the Foundation João Pinheiro of Minas Gerais. Monica, she is graduated in public administration and law. She is a specialist in economy law and in the management of people. She is a master also for public administration and doctor in the University of Minas Gerais. She has been there since 1994. She's a specialist in public policies. And she has occupied the role of superintendent of public policies and strategy. And she's a chief of the planning of the state of Be of the city of Belo Horizonte. Thank you so much, Monica, for being here. And also would like to call to the table Diogo Lima. She, he is a part of the movement People Ahead and coordinator of the Republica.org. Thank you. He is a social science uh, major 
he is also uh, he is also major in public administration administration uh, project management and planning in the public sector he's been talking a lot about leadership and i would like to start asking a question a little bit generical question but i, I don't know if it's an obvious question why invest so much in leadership we're going to start with monica good morning everyone this investment in leadership it came through a provocation of the third sector to the foundation joan pinheiro to change the experience that we had with leadership um, starting with an invitation that Foundation Lema did at the time to our foundation, João Pinheiro, to develop a leadership program to the second level of the government of the state of Minas Gerais. They wanted them, they wanted to um, change and have this program. Uh, they had a traditional model and we started a new experience, a different experience uh, to work with more robust programs and that leadership had an experience that could be transforming. We have a project in Minas Gerais that is called Transformation Minas Gerais, not only about development, also we do an evaluation and the selection, we have engagement, and us from the Foundation João Pinheiro, we started working with the development of leadership and the importance of all of this is because we generally believe in the transforming power to deliver results to society. So we started with the second level of the government of Minas Gerais, and then we went to the regional leadership. We work, we have been working since 2020 with more than 100 leaders, uh, le regional leaders in education, public policies, environmental, and we have been extending this to other uh, levels. Foundation João Pinheiro also provides uh, um, help to other cities in other parts of the state. For example, we have a leadership formation for all the managers in schools in the municipality of Belo Horizonte. There were 600 uh, school principals so we see that this has also been a need of some uh, team areas in the public sector, not just for high executives, but also in Minas, we have thought about starting work, start working uh, with leaderships in a practical way. So this is a proposal for the next year. So we can start this project and uh, we have started in 2019. We had an area in the foundation that was dedicated to leadership programs and ma people management. We had the support from Lenka, from Vanos, that this is the partnership that we have had. And this has been fundamental so we can move forward in this process. So Monica has mentioned this topic. The third sector today has an important role about public leadership in Brazil. So recently, there was the establishment of this movement that translates the trend of the last years, which is not a trend just in Brazil. I believe it's international. And you have proposed as a movement the construction of a reference for a national policy of leadership it involves not only development but other kinds of reflections i would like you to talk about the study uh, about your findings so we can have uh, so we can build a leadership in the public sector in brazil thank you thank you rodrigo good morning everyone it is a pleasure to be here with you, sharing this table with you. Well, it is an excellent reflection. First of all, I would like to talk about the 
organize civil society in this discussion to put in vogue the people, the management of people in the public sector. We, as organizations in the third sector, we believe that the civil society, when it mobilizes, when it organizes itself, we have interesting reflections about society and the government. And we understand that people in the public service, as others said, we have organized this uh, movement, people ahead, to reinforce the policies that permeate the areas of people in the government. And we started the first point of transformation, the policies for leadership. And speaking specifically about this document, it's called Policies for Leadership. It's a simple name. You can find it in the website of the movement Pessoas à Frente, People Ahead. In this document, we did a very collective construction. We got, we gathered uh, specialists, for example, from ENAPI. It was leadered by Diogo Costa, the president of ENAPI. And we had many references of government, state, of the academia to build references, national and international references about the topic. So we could have a document uh, that showed proposals to build policies, so the governments and the interested entities could have the base, so they could build their own practices. And we have some pillars uh, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, first of all, the trend for global tendencies we have a good government and this good government has to be prepared that has to prepare the leaders the leaders so we have to think about a match between the, the role you have and what skills you need for that role and then you can sync people to occupy those important roles in the government so a good plan for the government, a good government worries about this issue to put people to put people that are more prepared with the necessary skills in the roles so they can have these policies. So this is the first thing that we have to reflect. We put this in the document, and it was the basis to build this document. Another thing is about transparency on the selection for those roles in open processes that mobilize society, different professional profiles, and they aggregate legitimacy to the process and to the government. We are ending an evaluation study to implement the results from the partnership in the state and government. And one of the positive findings is that the selection processes with transparency, they aggregate legitimacy. Many people said that they didn't see themselves in the government before finding this process. And this connects uh, with the third point of our policy, of our document, that the government should be a good employer. So to provide the necessary conditions, so we have the leadership and the teams of people that occupy the different roles in the government so that they can develop their work, develop their skills, and they can develop themselves. So we guide some pillars that Monica has mentioned already that involves attraction of professionals for these roles of different areas. So we can have different outlooks in the government. The government has to be an aggregator. And the intention of these professionals through uh, policies of performances and engagement of these people that occupy these roles in the government. With that, we can guarantee a largest effectiveness 
of the public policies and we so ensure they can be ready for to face those challenges that our colleagues have just mentioned before very good just taking advantage to talk about the enough experience regarding these points uh, throughout 2020 we had a long process of benchmarking regarding the, co the skills and uh, the needed skills for the public sector leader this was a research done on the uh, here in this school and uh, we analyzed more over than 10 uh, countries to have an inspiration to build this set of skills and this is a very important thing for their journey in this work of leadership in the federal government because the first time we had a formal proposal and nowadays we have nine skills that are references um, benchmarks for the evaluation assessment for the public sector in the federal government leaders one of these skills uh, and i'm is mentions uh, the skill of having a, a future and strategic view leader needs to understand what are the biggest trends in the ecosystems he, ecosystem he is inside and our colleagues have mentioned that these challenges for the future digital transformation to ha having a modern government uh, developing a sustainable government how to work with leadership to reach these challenges. That's the question, how to work with them? How can we work with leadership so they can reach these trends and to work with these challenges? Uh, they need to acquire new skills for the future. So how do we uh, carry these reflections to these leaders? our base at the beginning of our conversation with our partners in the um, construction of these programs is the identification of these skills and what we see and it's interesting is that it doesn't change much we have a name change but there is a core a hard core of skills that is always present to the uh, leadership in the public sector, regardless of the organization we are talking about. And when we need to deal with these challenges, one very important topic when it, that we have to work on these development programs, uh, other than these skills, is the importance of this network uh, to is, strengthen this uh, of confidence bounds uh, to have a more cooperative structure with these leaderships. So the strength of this network is what will be able to deal with these challenges uh, in the future. And what we have seen uh, from these uh, people with statements, those people that were in this program is that this is the main outcome for them. They come out of the program recognizing that the content, the experience exchange was very rich, but the network they built there was the was that built uh, aggregated more value to them, and we believe that this is the greatest power of transformation to deal with these challenges in the future. Joe, I'd like to hear from you uh, about the topic that we talk, mentioned before which is the importance of the diversity on the uh, leadership uh, base. We will announce in one of the stage uh, of the profile for the higher public, uh, public server. Uh, so when we talk about gender and race, we see that there is a great discrepancy on the composition of for the uh, public sector uh, personnel compared to the Brazilian society. Uh, it's very discrepant. There is a great discrepancy. For example, in some uh, a hierarchical level, we see that there is not a black person uh, in, in this position. So I would like to hear from you uh, about the importance about the presentation of 
a representation of our society uh, in a better way from these people. And in second way, how can we have a better approach or from the leaders to the society? What channels can we build to have better communication, to have leaders a little closer to society and so that his decisions can reflect better their needs? These are two complex questions, but uh, expect you to answer them well. So I will try to answer them in a way that is very objective. I will try. First question, I start off uh, inverting and proposing a reflection. The state and the public policies propose to address solutions to the different public problems that society, uh, our society has. And we know that in this different levels of uh, public problems, we have different uh, different problems that affect the reality of people. And as a consequence, the solutions that we need to address for different uh, target audiences, scenarios, and etc. So everyone is in agreement with that, right? But uh, taking this scenario, this portrait, and uh, coming back to the government. Let's understand if the government has got a structure that has the perception and depth of understanding these problems, either in the culture to understand these problems, that they exist, they are structural, they affect the, our reality, or on the point of perspective of people that compose this scenario. So there is a great power of representation in any type of structure, not only government. And Brazil has a great uh, diversity in race, cultural way. We cannot just uh, take leave that aside of the government. It's a great loss. So we need to address good solutions to the government. So we need to do the government with the Brazilian face. So just to be simple, there is the importance of uh, bringing more equity and inclusion diversity to the government because this will help us to address better the solutions for the uh, our problems and also uh, to have a better and plural composition that represents our society. We see great gains with that in different uh, international and national researchers regarding the potential that diversity has, especially in terms of innovation, because you have different perspectives to work with the same solution. So this first topic is very rich and very important to be addressed. Not, not mentioning the historical terms and I'm really trying to be very specific in my uh, answer. And the second one is how can we work this uh, structures out to have a uh, better diversity of gender and races uh, and different topics that we can address for the governmental structure. We've worked uh, throughout the partnership and the Pessoas of uh program. We have a program that discusses these diversity topics uh, regarding gender and race. And we have different points that are uh, some levers to transform this reality. We need first to understand the importance of this politics uh, for the public sector in Brazil. Uh, it, this research will come out right now, but I understand that Brazil is very bad uh, performed compared to the other national government regarding the, uh, the diversity. We see other countries with a, uh, a public a politics system very similar to ours in better position. So we need to promote politics that can provide this access to these individuals so they can have the better uh, and 
uh, accessible conditions to develop what we have already mentioned. And the second one is the access to data. We have a difficulty to track the profile of the public sector professional because of lack of data. We have gaps to understand the, the race the, of people, uh, to compose the, the frames of the public sector. And we need a better transparency of this data to have a better diagnosis, to address better solutions for this question. And another topic is the importance of the committees in the government that work and support the cultural transformation to induct better politics, to make more transverse, transversal the agenda. Historically, it's something that was there and it was not being performed. And with the debates, this uh, was in the health sector, in education, and the economic development. And it's a central agenda that permeates all the government and all the public problems that the government has have to go to this agenda. And to wrap up, we need to make a cultural shift, the temperament, understanding of people, youth, for example, as a public professional and those who are listening to us. You understand the importance of forming yourself so, on a permanent way. We understand that it's uh, uh, fundamental to work better. Why not to form ourselves in this topic? to open our horizons and perspective to understand better the possibilities and as a consequence to be more permeated to the importance of this agenda and be allies to address better solutions to this topic that's so deep and structural in Brazil. I don't know if I haven't answered your question. It was much better than I expected. I would like to uh, take advantage to uh, make a propaganda. We have a course of public uh, uh, politics in the administration area, so it's a very good course. Uh, then I will provide the invitation to those who are watching us so they can enroll to this course, which is very good. It talks about uh, the importance of this uh, inclusion. We offer quotes to our courses to uh, black people, uh, indigenous people, also for those who need to uh, actually have this inclusion. And in the next courses in the leadership, they all, always count on the uh, gender parity. We try to include uh, this parity. So these constructions are very important so we can project a body of leaders that's more diverse that represents also the society. And I understand that the very ability to generate diversity is already something that helps us to be more adherent to our society. Just to mention one example, in this year we had the formation course for two new specialists on the public management sector and they were going to not social politics, uh, they were going to offices, but they needed to make the internship in the people with a uh, street situation so they can understand better the demands of society. It's not, supposed to, not possible to have people that were working in the public sector and don't know the reality of a country. It's true that this is a more symbolic uh, idea, but it's important to uh, have them to understand better the needs of the our country. And on this topic, still on this topic, I'm just going wait, uh, going beyond, but uh, I'd like to talk about this adherence to reality uh, because you guys work with the local leaders and managers, those who are in the schools, living the public uh, politics on day-to-day -day life. In the NAP, we have done a great uh, uh, formation program for them. And we had uh, around um, uh, 1,200 leaders enrolled. Uh, and I believe that your challenge is even greater because it's your 
day-to-day -day work. And at the same time, I'm very glad to have great reflections of uh, international trends and understand that the public uh, challenges sometimes in, in the uh, field that we have here in Brazil, sometimes they are like beginners, they are initial. So I would like to hear from you a little bit, how can we deal with these initial realities, these uh, realities we have in Brazil? And that's why it's important to build in the beginning the skills that our partners need to develop. And when we talk about the manager that is on the field, we need to have this site. We construct these skills with him uh, and work his leadership uh, for uh, content uh, and skills that are near to his reality. We take project management, programs, process management, and themes that uh, we sometimes don't even talk about uh, and so uh, because these are other reflections and strategies that we adopt but they are also very important to have their feedback uh, about the programs uh, they they say this changes their reality with simple strategies, for example, time management. Uh, this is a challenge. It's not specific uh, to them. High executives also have this challenge. It is very interesting to listen to their comments. They say, this module has changed my life. Uh, this made a difference in my life. I work in a different way. This has added value to my daily life. So at the same time that this is a soft skill competence, we also try to bring this to the reality, to their reality, because this is what makes every difference. This is what adds value to their lives. And just also talking about what was asked uh, to Diogo, because what you have offered to us, it was incredible. I couldn't not say that. I am part of this working group and we discuss uh, just, uh, we don't discuss this a lot with our leaderships. We discuss this in a very superficial way. I think that we talk about diversity, but still in a way that doesn't bring a transformation. I think this working group has a huge potential because we have to rethink management of people looking at the diversity. So I think this was an investment that can make a difference, make a huge difference when we close the cycle this year. So there will be projects and uh, chronograms that are more consistent and that we can move forward. Well, I'm going to ask a last, uh, another question to you, Diogo. I want to take advantage of uh, your, of your trainment and your graduation he is a specialist of uh, applied quantitative methods. I cannot not ask about data. We've heard from some colleagues uh, from Kenya and Canada the importance to take data and uh, do this public reflection and also that the leadership has to take this into account. What is the importance of this new moment, of this information age that we live in? And how can this, in a certain way, be a skill and be used to improve the leadership courses? Well, I really, it really changed my paradigm, the previous um, conversation from digital to modern so let's let's use this term modern so this challenge is set 
the importance of technology of transformation to deliver bad, uh, better public policies. How can we improve leadership policies? Well, a good policy of selection and attraction, it is important to reinforce the, in, the political nomination, the political choice. We want to bring more uh, technicity, merit to this point, and we start doing that by using technology. How can you attract a lot of people and you can filtrate a lot of profiles without using technology? We have been discussing the partnership in the partnership. How can we use how can we improve the attraction technologies, the selection of people in the selective processes that are open? So we start by that, the importance of technology to these policies. Also, secondly, about the performance and development of these public servants, it is essential to do the monitoring of the activities to do the management and the continuous improvement of the skills to explore strengths. We're talking about organizations and entities that gather um, thousands of leadership roles. So we follow up on this, and this is not possible without technology. So there is a high potential of the tools, of the analytics, so we can have better scenarios, better diagnostics, and especially talking about leaders, how can we support the trainment process, the continuous process or in scale like ENAP does it with the public servants all over Brazil? João Pinheiro also does that with the uh, state's uh, public servants and the munici municipal public servants. We do that by uh, adding education tools, technology, other products that make access easier to the classroom, virtual or in-person format. So I just wanted to give you some examples of how technology, how this change of paradigm can support the transformation about this specific topic of leadership. Thank you, Diogo. Well, if I could add, we have talked a lot about that. The professionalization of the public service uh, is to do our actions in a professional way. So the public policies have to be based on that. And we are investing a lot in this, in the school, in the raising awareness of the leaders to work on this perspective. I think this is a trend that where there's no turning point. And this is good because the public policies are better and we make better decisions. So we're going to wrap the session, but we are going to still be here. Now we're going to a round of Q&A. We're going to try to get some uh, questions from the internet, from people that are here. And I think João has a question. I think uh, we have a question already for Puja and you. And also for Nadia. Oh, Nadia, unfortunately, has left. There's a question over here that's a very interesting question from uh, Pedro Aníbal Drago uh, from Brazil, and, and he would like to know about information from a political and your perspective new as well in Canada, if there are some experience, research, or good practice on uh, impact evaluation uh, in, in the leadership programs. We know that is a gap here in the public administration, especially when we, we're dealing with training uh, in terms of impact evaluation. Can you please... Can we? Can you please share your experience on that level? Thanks a lot. We can start with with uh, New first, and then we can we can go to Puja. 
Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, impact evaluation is an area that's going to benefit greatly from data analytics and more modern techniques for analyzing data. So I think um, if you're in the area of program evaluation and impact evaluation, this is an area of huge growth. I'm not aware of methodologies that I could share off the cuff with respect to the impact of leadership on, on organizations. I think most of the data we have are qualitative. Pooja? Pooja, can you hear us? I, th I think you're on mute. Oh, can I can I can I can I address the same questions for you, Pujo? If you have experience, good practice, and and research on impact evaluation from a political, yeah. Yes, I'm so sorry. I wasn't able to unmute myself. So I wasn't sure what was happening. Um, so, in fact, we're actually about to launch a um, a project, a research project with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, in January, where we are collecting data on the methodologies that governments are using to both assess gaps in their capacity and capability building, but also how they are tracking the impact and the outcomes of whatever training they're doing on that. And the aim of this project is to A, collect the methodologies from around the world uh, and be able to create that in a accessible manner on, on and freely available for all governments and other um, stakeholders on the apolitical platform uh, in a way that they can download, hopefully, the methodologies that are best suited for the right budget, the right outcome, the right level of civil service, and so on. So I, can, I hope I can share that with, with um, Inapi and others present in the room uh, by the end of next year or so. But I, I also wanted to come to Inapi to join this project right from the start so you can, be, you can have the access to that data right from the start. Thanks a lot, Pooja. É, acho que o Mônica também tem experiência, né, Mônica? A gente, esse é um desafio, né? This is a challenge. What is the impact that the investments in leadership programs have, indeed? And for a program, for a leadership program, also for people management and for public management, uh, the first uh, challenge for the first group uh, was an evaluation process, and we constructed with the Fundação João Pinheiro since the start a baseline so we could have this evaluation. We had nine states involved, a team from nine states, and uh, we had four stages in this evaluation. And one of them happened six months after the program, so we could try to analyze what was the impact of this program to beyond the, the aspects that we evaluate, if the methodology was the right methodology and so on. And it was a very interesting experience so we could have and we could see some states that could implement some actions, some projects, some projects started to be developed in the scope of the program. But we still had many challenges because it's a costly project we cannot have in all our programs. It's a long process. The engagement after the end of the program, so we can really evaluate the impact. It is lower, the engagement. We had many challenges. Uh, it was very interesting, but we could have indicators and we could see points for improvement for the program. Also, it brought important reflections uh, for those people that were engaged. So we sat down with the team and it said, we have identified that the involvement from the Secretary of the Human Resources was really fundamental. So if he was not completely involved, the transformation would not happen. And this was very clear in this evaluation after six months. So we could do that for this program we cannot do for all the programs because it takes a long time and it's expensive it was a very rich experience but this is still a challenge to how to do this in a scale uh in the development programs to evaluate the impact of these programs thank you 
I don't know if anybody here from the audience wants to ask any questions. You just raise your hands and I will give you the microphone. Oh, we have a question here. La Good morning. First of all, I would like to congratulate Enapi to about talking uh, to talk about diversity and include diversity in this uh, round of conversation because many times we talk about the diversity and we don't have a diversity in the group. So my question and my greatest difficulty is to how to solve a solution that I see in the ministry. I am from the Ministry of Culture and I see that there's a turnover, a very big turnover in the secretary. I think about uh, we, we had about eight secretaries and changes. So there is a few engagement with the team and also with the agenda. So I keep thinking how to how to make this uh, in a scale, how to take this into another level. How could we solve this about leadership? Do we focus on the fixed leadership or how, how do you do that uh, so that the great leaders, the high executives in the ministry would make a difference with this big turnover that we have in the executive power? This is a very difficult question to answer, indeed. It is difficult for us uh, because we are conducting the programs of development because you start with a group and they change a lot. Uh, the people in the group change a lot. So what we observe in the state of Minas Gerais in, in about the subsecretaries, about the second level of government, we have a lower engagement. And when we go to the regional levels, we have more than 100 leadership that uh, went through the selective process. They are with us. There is a lot of change, a lot of change. So this is a challenge for us to keep people engaged in the program. So, but we have to find some strategies. Uh, we, we count on the force of this uh, network to bring these people closer to us. So this is something that uh, we try to potentialize uh, in also in smaller groups. We have methodologies for that. Many moments we work with smaller groups to build these trust relationships because we believe that this brings a certain improvement about engagement um, in terms of institution, in terms of organization, and also with the, the working group. But it's a challenge. We are try we are doing a trial and error um, methodology. Could I could I jump in on this point? Sure. I would just want to say that in Canada, equity, diversity, and inclusion is a major preoccupation of public service leaders. Uh, from the very most senior levels to the most junior levels, uh, it is uh, something which is a priority and it takes a full court press to make progress in this area. It requires measurement, it requires dialogue, training, it requires different approaches to hiring and talent management, and it has been a significant uh, uh, preoccupation uh, for us in Canada, and we are seeing some progress uh, as a result. I would really encourage you in all of your leadership practices to, um, to uh, to reflect on how you can use your own span of control uh, to uh, make progress on equity, diversity, and inclusion. It is absolutely essential as managers and as caretakers, but as public officials uh, to, to incorporate this in your practice. Great, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Olá, bom dia a todos. Eh, eu sou Daniela, sou coordenadora, ocupo um cargo de... Good morning, everyone. I am a manager in the medium a leadership in the executive. And on this uh, speech, I just had an insight. It's a great challenge to have a, a quantity and because of the quantity of people, uh, since we have a great representative of, of representation of these high executive, executives, one 
idea could uh, could be to act with the medium leadership below because they are normally there and because of their development they are eager to grow and this can help to change i'm just throwing that on the table so we can reflect this can change the culture organization when we have a medium leadership that can have a better notion or a better understanding of this uh, leadership development for this future that we expect when we have this medium leadership that has a less relativity but has a, a better power and interest in on what the leadership needs to have that's what i see it's my view uh, being in this place i understand that the higher executive would have a better openness to have these licenses what i understand is that the high executives they um in terms of leadership we have i have a lot of uh, contact with these higher executives and what i understand is that there is exclusivity for the government it's very present in all the leaders that those who are in the higher positions they have a perspective of uh, just uh, supporting their legacy they already are close to the change they are close to the new skills because they are already in there in there they have already acquired what they wanted to acquire and we see that uh, nowadays the leadership they are not serving the same way as like before so we need to have this better openness to the newest uh leaders so what why don't we try to uh train these medium leaders so we can strengthen the culture and this way, the uh, higher leadership, they will have to adequate to the culture. So I just changed the challenge. I think it's something that we have to, uh, to think about. Yes, I, I was um, smiling away because this is something that we strongly believe at Apolitical that um, while it's of course important to invest in, in um, leaders of any uh, executive or um, civil service, it's equally important important to really upskill the public servants who are responsible for converting a lot of those commitments into real policies, programs, and services. And I think they often get um, uh, left out, mainly because of costs. There's lots of costs involved of delivering these trainings and investing in it at scale. Uh, there's also about the what kind of topics are important for a mid-level is very different from other layers and so on. But I think it's also a mindset shift about who is a leader and at what levels do leaders need to get built and how do we invest in them? So we're definitely a huge um, believer that technology especially has changed that game. We can leverage technology to provide training at scale, huge numbers of people and build leaders at different um Tiers. Uh, the last thing I would also say it, is thinking about institutional knowledge retention. And instead of sort of thinking about when somebody leaves an institution, it's not sort of a, a trend of brain drain that happens, but how do you kind of, again, by training more numbers of people within a department um, or, or a team, you ensure that it sort of remains within the institution, even if people change. So definitely a strong advocate for that suggestion. Thank you, Pooja. Just to add, uh, I will present in the next session, but uh, we, we develop a, um, an area here to develop the future leaders in the public sector in Brazil. Uh, it's uh, one of the three parts of our strategy. And I think that the next step for uh, ENAP and for the, the Brazilian government is uh, bring uh, the, the development of the middle level and the other levels of leadership. So I think the, the challenge for the next two or three years is uh, to, to reach a more uh, uh, wider uh, group of, uh, of uh, civil servants and uh, create capacity in the, in the other levels of the structure. Uh, a gente tem tempo para mais uma pergunta e acho, acho que ela já estava. We have time for one more question, right? Let's uh, just take these last two questions because we are out of time. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Claudia. I'm from the Federal Senate. I work with the leadership, uh, feminine, female leadership, and I'm very glad to be in this event to see 
all this uh, new perspective on the public sector, I'd like to uh, ask a question to Mayo because he brought up a concept of the profiles, the two profiles, uh, the guards and the vanguards. Um, maybe they would be, yes. Uh, I would like to know if in Canada you have an action, an initiative that stimulate these guardians that are important for this balance, for the cares we need to have, but that they cannot uh, be uh, in the same mentality mindset they have uh, from the past. That really spoils sometimes our progress. So I would like to hear of how you are doing to work this mindset of these guardians. So they don't lose their profile, but they at the same time be in harmony with the environment so they uh in what they need from the vanguardians thank you uh so i one thing i need to say is that all of our training or at least the grand majority of the training that we have for public service leaders in canada is around guardianship so you can take courses on your hr authorities your financial authorities the law the policies, the regulations, and we we are very good at forming guardians, but we have not done a, as good a job forming vanguards. Uh, and I should also add that while some people's roles are define them as guardians and vanguards, most of us have both of these roles all the time. So I'm drawing a distinction uh, in order to, to make a point, but of course we are all guardians and we are all vanguards. Uh, and so if you're interested in the training that we provide to our guardians, I could fill your boots. The curriculum of the Canada School of Public Service essentially is uh, geared towards uh, guardians, uh, but we are only now introducing courses in design thinking, in problem definition, in innovation and experimentation. And in fact, Apolitical is a great platform to learn some of these techniques and offers courses in digital and design, uh, agile and in um, innovation and experimentation. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Camila. Thank you, uh, everyone. I would just like to add up one thing, because in Brazil, we just to share with the uh, foreigner speakers, we do have these initiatives in Brazil to think of these medium leaderships to occupy these future positions, which is the Lideragovi program. I am the coordinator of it. It's a program to develop these new positions uh, for those who are in the one, two, three positions or those who are not occupying or are thinking to uh, and have their soft skills to occupy then. So we are preparing then through this program. So we do have this challenge of this scale, this scalability, because we do not have how to uh, work with uh, many people because we are working 600, 6,000 people. We are in the ADR grade rating. But this is already a great initiative with a partnership with Sanapi to get to overcome these challenges, these challenges of uh, formation of these new leaderships. For those who don't know this yet, please go to the server portal, go to the Lideragov program in the website and see that there is already in this country something that can be an example for those, for other institutions can also form uh, their leadership with the view that we are having these debates. So please take a look on that. Uh, it, this is a very good remark. I'd like to congratulate your work, uh, Dalva's work and SJPSC work, uh, uh, which is the personal uh, and performance management for the economic uh, uh, ministry program. Uh, they have several program processes and it's a very good partner for INAP in these past years. So congratulations for your work. So we don't have more time. I need to close up our debate section. I would like to thank all of you. Uh, ability. Uh, obrigado, Monica. Obrigado, uh, uh, Diogo, por... Pela uh, thank you, Diogo, Monica. I will go to the next section in our panel, the next panel, the last section. I invite you, all of you to be with us. We'll uh, undo this table, but we are invited to stay with us. Uh, we have 20 minutes, 10 minutes to 
go to the next section. I lost 10 minutes of my speech, so uh, I just will get up to next next presentation. Let's clap our uh, speakers, please. So I'd like to ask all of you to, uh, I would like to ask for you to share the screen. Uh, we have this closing uh, section of this moment. Uh, we need to talk about what we have developed in a uh, public administration school regarding the uh, leadership development. We'd like to tell a little bit the story, what happened, what has gone, what have gone through. I'd like to offer the invitation for everyone who are here to make the check-in. You have the QR code of this document we are just launching, which is, which is the uh, leadership and strategy for public uh, leadership in the Brazilian government uh, training. So in the beginning, when I had, I just took up this position in an app in 2019, we are still designing the Lideragov program, which is a program for these future leaders uh, uh, formation. So in the office, we were thinking about inspiring, inspiring leaders for us. In on that moment, I had a reflection, and I was very lucky to get to the conclusion that when I got to the public sector, I just got two very good mentors. Informal mentors who were responsible for the uh, remaining of my career, and I just told this story that in the meeting. Uh, that I had these two people. One was my uh, immediate boss at that moment. She was like a tractor. She was uh, a very good problem solver. She had very good outcomes, uh, etc. And on the other side, I had another colleague who was uh, a director on the education ministry. And he would always come to me and say, look, let's think of a strategy. Let's think of why we do these things. Why are you doing this politic? And I just mentioned these two combinations that was the best combination I could have because at the same time that you look at the uh, target, you need also to understand uh, why you are doing that. You have to execute it to think strategically. In this document is uh, telling why we are doing everything that we did in this school in these past times. We have good. We've got very good and positive feedbacks of the courses, of our delivery ability, and everything has a uh, has a why. Let's open this document to see. Everything is synthesized in this document, and that's what the great reflection that guided our works in uh, in the past years. First of all, uh, the first question of the board was why we chose to work with leaderships. We understand that the leader uh, investment generates an impact uh, on the organizational uh, chain. Uh, this is comproved uh, with data, uh, with the studies, uh, have comproved that with the a British studies. And the main term is the relationship with the leaders. The same study shows that in all the situations, all the people that are more engaged, they generate better results. They show that leaders are capable to transform their organizational culture in the, in the the places they work. So it is quite important to invest in the leadership. And when we think about the federal government, we're thinking about 9,000 high executives in the government. In the universe of 600,000 people. So this is a small percentage. So it is uh, good to make the effort and the investment for that. We have a retrospective here that demonstrates this trend 
to work with the leadership, in 2016, ENAP created a specific area for the government. This was created in 2016, following an international trend. ENAP historically always has worked with the formation of leaders, but we built this area to give this area a little bit of a system. This is very important. And since then, we have been conducting this work to try to attract the high executive, the public leader. And in the beginning, we use a lot of the international partnerships. So we went to Harvard Business School. We had courses so we could attract the leader here because it was very difficult for the leader to stop what they were doing and acquire new skills, new capacities. Um, with the time, uh, the partnerships were very important and we gained credibility. Uh, people saw that it was worth coming to an app to uh, train. The investment was worthwhile. And this was an accomplishment that has happened throughout the these last uh, 15, 16, 17 years. This was something incredible to be able to be recognized by the government. In 2019, we started um, building a strategy to develop new leaders. So what did we want with that? First of all, to answer this question, we wanted to have a, a reference. We wanted to build this study to build competences to leaders. What was the leader that we wanted to have? What competences the, did the leader need to have? And we had a research conducted by the team. We didn't hire anybody. Well, all was done here in our team. We had people from 10 different countries. We built a proposal with the Ministry of Economy to formalize these competences. And we could do that in the beginning of 2021. And then we started to have this reference. We knew what and who was that leader. So we conducted meetings, uh, virtual meetings. We have also in our repository, we can put this in our chat. We explain the competences. It's not written stone. They are very fluid. They can, they can change throughout time because the competences and the demands, they change as well. But it was the first time in the history of the government that uh, this was formalized. And the idea of this event is to show you how we implemented that. I'm going to ask you to pass. OK, go the, to the next slide, please, to the one that we have the puzzle. Yeah, you can go ahead. There you go. We have many challenges. Who, who is this leader? That What kind of value the, does it? it generate, but we wanted to focus on the proposal to tackle the, the challenges that we had. The first one is to continue the trainment of these 9,000 executives. These are the conductors of the transformation process in the government. Something that was very important and that Diogo mentioned, he couldn't be here the president of ENAP, he couldn't be here. But I would really like to thank him for trusting our work and for allowing us to have deep reflections about this topic. And we talked about the importance to talk about the formation of the leaders of the government and the municipalities. Our country is uh, very big, and we have about 11 million public servants all over the country, and we cannot not we cannot think small. We have to think big. We have to really impact the public servants. So we had to improve this, and we had to work with the formation of the leaders of the government and state. So besides this we had to bring to the agenda 
the formation of local leaders. And we were very bold and brave about that. So I'm going to show you the numbers. And we also needed to invest in the succession. Besides the people that are in the office now, we had to invest uh, in the structure in, and also build the investment of future leadership. So these were the three pillars that guided our operation that composed the strategy. I'm going to ask you to pass a little bit, move forward. Yes, on the presentation. You can go back to the first. So some things that I wanted to mention. Many times we spoke about how to reach those leaders, because one thing is to want them to be here, but we don't have the, they don't have the time and we had to be very precise. So how could we reach them with the diversification of the offer? We really needed that different leaders had access to different trainings because of their demand, because of their time. So this reflected on the capacity to offer new projects and new programs throughout time. Here, I have to talk about the team because they have the innovation mind. They proposed all the time new ideas, new programs, and then we expanded these resources. Today, there is a lot of information that is available on leadership and competences on leadership in the internet, in repositories, etc. What is the biggest problem? Is curator, uh, uh, we have to select the content. So we have to send a, a weekly report with podcasts, with resources. So since 2020, we sent these reports every week and we started to um, gather more people. It was one more resource. Our courses, we had a problem. We couldn't offer Harvard forever. It was more than one million highs. So we expanded our partnerships so we could bring professors from other institutions international and national institutions to maintain this high quality, but at the same time, also make our, co our courses a little bit uh, um, less expensive. And also our evaluations uh, show that our courses are highly evaluated, more than nine out of 10. So we kept the quality. And in this diversification, there is something bold that is to talk about the mentorship program. We didn't have that developed, but we had an extensive research to show what was the most professional format that we could offer. And we could build this program in collaboration with partners from the private sector and it was very successful. Besides the selection and of the projects, we had the opportunity to have the sharing of knowledge with people that have experience on the public service. It was so successful that we decided to uh, be even bolder, create a new methodology with the guide and share this guide. We brought 11 uh, entities from the government, the Foundation João Pinheiro as well. And we could spread the culture of mentorship because we cannot be just in a small group. If we're working with the government, we, are, we have to be able to face the challenge and face the size of our country. So this was another gain that we had. 
It is an enormous uh, set of offers. And another strategy was the front end. I think many of you here know. The idea was that it was not just a talk. It was the creation of connections from, with the high executives and also people that were innovators that could bring some experience to the public and bring some reflections that were not uh, in the government, like blockchain, carbon, some topics that were still um, new to the government. And so we could have this interaction and then this integration. I'm talking about this offers, these offers, because it's not enough to give courses. We have to reach that leader somehow. And we have doubled the number of projects that we offer uh, since 2019. In the second uh, pillar, as I said, of states and municipalities, we had a big challenge, but we also had a window of opportunities, which it was the new mayors that came uh, that came to the government. And we knew that this would not repeat, at least in this cycle. So we had a coordination from an app and we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity we went we sought 20 different partners in the third sector private sector international entities governments so we could make it viable and we thought that a lot of people would come to us very easily and this is not real we had a, a worksheet to exclude and to do the selection. Oh, first of all, we don't to do this and that with a lot of criteria. We had some um, data and in the end, we saw that it didn't work, it, that the leadership in the local level, it lives in his or her own world with his or her problems. And we had to look for them, not the opposite, because when because there they live another reality and we had to seekly seek actively seek people we had to mobilize a lot of people to go after this population and we have learned a lot we saw that federal government was not ready to do this so we were acquiring this formation throughout time we were counting on people that had the experience with local governments and the numbers are impressive for the program. Mariana, she is looking at me, you know, in a very angry way. I have to finish. Yeah. And the numbers are impressive, but not just the numbers, especially we worked a lot with diversification of offers, connection with the SDGs, the possibility to work with the practical labs this made all the difference and i think this was a determining factor so we could uh, change the policy thanks to the program and the impact that the program had we got to more than five thousand municipalities almost 10 percent of the municipalities in the country so for a, such a short time, this was something that we're very proud of. And to end, the program that Camila mentioned related to development of future leadership, which is Lideragov. We started in an experimental way, directly connected to, to the competences that I mentioned. And it could, throughout this time, create a formation uh, for those that are not leaders, not just with classes and also the chief of the, the people. people. This process, so this all uh, gave you a holistic ability to look at the leader formation and 
nowadays we have a potential leadership to available to the occupation of these uh, leadership of the positions and we expect this to be the acts of that can grow on this uh, volume. Some actions that we normally involve, we try to put all these axes, the front end is something that's open, it has already got a Nobel Prize with a Nobel Award. The bullet the bulletin is already open to all the audiences. And in the end, I would like only to mention the premium leadership program uh, we have several courses for negotiation, personal branding, but in essence, what we uh, normally like to do is to provide this uh, leadership uh, overview. We want to replicate this course for several sectors uh, with cases in a professional way for the new uh, leadership skills. So this is the uh, story I would like to tell you about this work. Uh, this all was based on this uh, brand uh, construction strategy that we needed to develop. And I'd like to call Jean Victor to talk a little bit about this process because he was a great leader and I could not uh, not thank him because he arrived with a very intense way uh, putting his skills uh, in service with lots of connections and network in this area. So we need to celebrate a lot with the, the results we've achieved. Also, we have to thank all the team for all the outcomes we got and it remains the uh, this uh, challenge to deepen this strategy in the future, not only with what we have proposed, but to reach the new leadership to go to the uh, local governments and the state government too, to provide that to them. I'm very moved, Rodrigo. We knew each other in 2016. We joined NAPI uh, together. And each one of us, we had our own path. And I think I still remember that I told you one day that I said, uh, one day we will still work together again. And these past two years have been uh, very revigorating. When we think of leadership and we occupy these leadership positions, we go step by step and when we go there, you can influence a lot. And you look back and you see all the effort you put back there and it's very rewarding. And today we are producing these uh, materials and it's, it moves me. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to call Mariana also so she can stop fighting me from the backstage. So if she wants to talk a little bit to Maria, I would like to thank you for this event for all the effort because we have set up in ADEX a coordination group in which all the decisions were taken in conjunct with this group. Our general coordinators were there and the other leadership levels were also there. It was fundamental to have the best decisions. Maria Gutinari is also part of this group. Paula Costa is also part of it. Bruna is not here, but she's also part of it. She's a very fundamental figure for this group and these conquests are very are a consequence of the skill of these people that can act with the sense of their impact that they can have on people's life. To wrap up, like only to announce that we uh, put available the uh, high position profile of the federal executives. Uh, it was necessary not only to, to talk about how to take the decision, but that we could take our decisions on base of the evidences and we needed uh, this, we had a lack of it. 
we had the lack of data of what the leaders that we work, how the leaders do we work or and we took the decision of not only uh, focusing on the development area, but we built this profile for that Flavia, who is here, is built for us. And she helped us. Pedro Masson, now the team helped on the this profile construction, and we had a survey to with the sample of leaders to understand some questions that were not addressed. Over than 700 leaders were uh, answered this survey. It's a very good number. Some questions, some answers that we wanted to know that was not present in CJEP. And also we made a uh, census with the CJEP data and it's available now. The survey data Are available, but we're also going to launch this uh, survey in the detailed way later on. We can do not have time to take a look on each day data, but we have data for now types, race, uh, data, information about the uh, knowledge of uh, foreign languages. We have cross data uh, regarding the occupation level in each uh, position, each uh, hierarchical level. And so it's a study that will help the development of the leaderships, but also some other initiative for the public management initiatives. And this product is uh, with expectations that this can be annual released so that we can have a historical, so that we have a Brazilian high position leader profile well-designed. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the CGKI team for the engagement. Lisa, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. And that's it. Well, there are two days, the executive summary and the assignment. The third one is the detailing of the census will come out next week and will be available in the radio on the Annapolis story and, and you can log into the QR code and it's the same link. And whoever can help us check the name of the QR code on the, oh, can uh, enroll in the uh, social media on the Instagram, please subscribe to our Instagram. Uh, okay, uh, the politics was very important uh, for this event, and they were very, Apuja was very important for this event and I'd like to thank her and everybody.